Hello, welcome back to the conversation. And do I have a conversation for you, baby? I know I say this every single time. And you know why? Because I just get the opportunity to have the best people join us in this conversation. But tonight, I got the one and only Dr. Julianne Malvo. She is an economist, an activist, a leader. I also call her a hell-raising humanitarian just like me. She is sheer fire. She is the president emeritus of Bennett College for Women, and currently she is the dean of the College of Ethnic Studies at Cal State LA. Ooh, T-Y-T. T-Y-T and the whole wide world. I get up and watch y'all, you know, watch that fat boy talks back. You know, y'all just do news in a way that makes me happy. That is good. We're so happy to hear that. And, you know, members help make TYT what it is. And we, as you know, we have to have independent media sources to really help give a different vantage point. And because of the viewers, uh, they invest in TYT. And that is the reason why we can do what we do. So. So glad you watch on a regular basis. I'm sure that Jink and the rest of the crew will be honored to know. the boy, fat boy, but he is. Uh, and he'll forgive me for it. But he is funny and he's very good. And, you know, and the little blonde woman who's with him, she good too. They crack me up in the morning. <laughs> Anna and Jink, they are very good. They have great, great chemistry together. So, Doc, what? You know, there's a lot going on in our country and also in the world right now, and that is an understatement. Uh, What, in your opinion, is some of the most critical challenges and opportunities of our time, of our moment? Well, I think the most important thing right now is to deal with the issue of voting rights. There are no rights without voting rights. And people do not give you voting rights. Voting rights are not like a present that someone hands to you, like, here's your gift, I'm gonna give you voting rights. Voting rights should be inalienable. If you are a United States citizen, if you were born here, you have voting rights or you should. So this nonsense, this mansion, this cinema, this McConnell, these people, it just makes me get up and scream. Um, What hits me, my senator sister, is that without voting rights, we could go back to states' rights. And we know what states' rights were for black people in particular, but for working people, for other people. And so I think that if we have to take it to the streets, if we have to, you know, these proud boys and peoples, don't get me started. I'm praying, Lord, I'm here with my sister. I don't want to be a jackass. Um, But what I want to say is that we must make these rights inalienable and we must fight for them like we fight for anything else and even more so. I love uh, the the Latasha Brown, Melanie Campbell, those sisters who are there saying do it. But I don't understand how there is not more passion. And I'm so angry with President Biden for taking a year to open his mouth, a year. If he really had our back, like he said, he would have done that stuff. Excuse me, he would have done that stuff as soon as he put his little narrow melanin in deficient hind parts into the Oval Office. He would have started with that. He started with build back better. How can you build anything back better if you don't have any voting rights? Very true, Doc. I mean, you and (laughs) Dr. Cornell West pretty much feel the same way on that. Dr. West has, has been out there That's really. Uh, and we go back, we, we, we go back, back, back. So, you know, I'm so old, but I love it. I'm, God is good. I'm so old. I, well, could, the, I mean, you're seasoned. If all of us live long I'm enough, we're going to be. I'm going to take old because you know what? I've talked okay. so much stuff. I've done so much stuff. It's a wonder some crazy white person ain't shot me. But if they did, I'd shoot them back. No, Doc, no, Mm-mm. we're not going to put that energy out there. We must protect Dr. Julian and my vote. So, Doc, I, you know, so the crit, so tonight, you know, they may be still going. I, pe- I peered in on them. they having this debate about yes. changing the rules on the filibuster, which it is a rule. It's not in the Constitution. These people are blowing my, my mind. 
right now playing these games. They don't even want to deal with the, you know, the the going back to the original rule of the filibuster, which is you had to stand up there for hours. Yes. And talk that talk. Now all they got to do is say, I filibuster, they don't have to do anything. But your point about voting should be inalienable. You know, Senator Romney, I got a chance to listen to, to some of what he had to say on the floor. And he's claiming that what Democrats are leveling is exaggerated, notwithstanding the hundreds of bills that have percolated state legislatures, to your point about states, right? Uh, over, over this session, over 550 of them, several of them have been made law, but just the fact that they are taking so many attempts. And most of these, all of these voting bills are not to expand and protect the franchise. It is absolutely to suppress it and compress it. So your so but Senator Romney back to him is basically saying that this is much to do about nothing and why should the Senate have to change its rules because people have the right to vote it is not under threat and you say what to the Senator Romneys of the world Senator Romney needs to get a grip the fact is that he don't see there are people in the United States Senate who know better, they know they wrong, but they don't mind being wrong. That's the problem. I mean, when you look at a Romney, Romney knows better. He is a relatively liberal, if you could use those words, the same uh, sentence, uh, Republican. He knows better. He knows he was a governor of Massachusetts. He is uh, someone who understands the Constitution. But many of them do, they understand it. They just don't give a you know what about it because somehow they have been mesmerized by the orange orangutan. So mesmerized that they really feel like we will put a firewall between people's rights and the Senate. The filibuster has always been wrong. We know it's been wrong, but Nina, as you know, my Senator sister, as you know, the filibuster was very different. Back in the day, yeah, you had to stand up for hours upon hours upon hours. Now you just have to say, I ain't feeling it. And that, no, white, predatory, capitalist Republicans are not feeling human rights. That's what it is. They're predatory capitalists and they are not feeling human rights. And the turtle from uh, wherever he's from, um, you know what I'm talking about, McConnell. I've tried not to curse. Um, And some of these people's names are curse words. but he knows better. They know better. That's what is so galling is that they know better, but they won't do better because they don't have to. Yeah, and they don't care. I mean, all of these people are set for their natural lives. So they really don't have a working class, poor person agenda at heart. Because if they did, not only is the filibuster blocking uh, the movement of voting rights, it is blocking the movement of other fundamental pieces of legislation that would help to enhance people's quality of life, build back better, even though it, it uh, has been scaled back from the way it started. But even that, you know, paid family leave, all of that. How it, tax credit, let's call right. down. Oh, John, yeah. you know, this is, we're at a time when we are in a civil war. It is the oligarch versus the people. That's literally where we are. We have people who are extracting surplus value from others. We have people who are scrambling to have their lives. We just finished with Dr. King's birthday. And one of the things that Dr. King said, he said, is socialism for the wealthy and rugged Uh individualism for the poor. And so do you hear these people talk about socialism as if it's a bad thing, but they got socialism. They have money yeah. going from the poor to the wealthy, from the poor to the wealthy. And meanwhile, you are telling poor people, y'all need to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And Dr. King spoke to that as well. He said, how do you pull people up from their bootstraps when they don't have boots? And this is where we are. And the fact is that these people are reveling in it because they're extracting surplus value from people. They're taking money from people. You are taking people, you see productivity go up and wages stay the same. Now, they, wages have gone up a it's little bitty, 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 bitty bit, bit. But we see basically productivity going like that and wages going like that. Well, what is this thing? That, I mean, people are debating this 
everything has gone up except for wages. How can that be? I mean, you and, and Doc, you are an economist. It doesn't, I mean, make it make sense that these folks are okay with the federal minimum wage not moving. It is in ten seven years, do- in, in eleven right. years. In eleven but years. But everything else has gone up, but the minimum wage has stayed flat. For those folks who say that minimum wage is supposed to be minimum wage and it's the free market. Doc, what does the economist in you say to people like that? First of all, freedom ain't free. At the end of the day, freedom ain't free. So when you talk about the free market, how free is a market that is constrained by a series of laws and regulations and responsibilities? Is that a free market? But secondly, when we look at the people who are at the bottom, they don't have. See, what we've done in the past two decades, my sister senator, is we have attacked the main way that unions are able to protect people. Unions have been weakened. So if a black man is in a union, he makes about a third more than a black man who's not in a union doing the same job. If a black woman is in a union, she makes about 25% more than a sister who is doing the same job not in a union. Unions have the ability to negotiate and to protect, but Fewer and fewer of us are in unions because, first of all, that man who used to be the president. But before that, I mean, this did not start. We have to be clear. That orange orangutan was evil. But somebody set a stage for evil to flourish. So we can't call it him. I'm not going to curse on your program, so I ain't going to mention his name. We're not going to call it him. What we're going to say is that there were others who were predatory capitalists who sidelined the rights of workers. And when in sideline healthcare, Nina, seriously, healthcare ought to be a human right. Yeah. So child care, how do you want people to work, but you don't want to take care of their children? And we could go down the list of all the things that have been stripped away from the social contract and is stripping those things away, we've left workers very vulnerable. And so over the course of a couple of decades, people as workers, as individual workers are weaker and weaker and weaker. And no one, not Republicans, but not Democrats. I mean, I'm sick of Democrats. I used to call myself a yellow dog Democrat. If the yellow dog was a Democrat, I'd vote for him. I'm not so sure about that anymore. I'm really not so sure about that anymore because I think that Democrats have done us wrong too. Because they have not done their work. They have shilly shallied around stuff. Um, they made stuff like, oh, how can I put it? Palatable. So, you know, my grandma used to say, you cannot make chicken salad out of chicken spit. It wasn't spit. Uh, but that's my grandma used to say, and you cannot make right out of a Democrat if the Democrat ain't right. I mean, you're certainly not alone in that. If we look at how most voters classify themselves, it is in the independent category, and that category is growing. And particularly Generation X and Generation Z, they're not so wedded to political parties as much as they want to know what you're standing for and what you are going to fight for. And it's increasing. I mean, people are really frustrated with the two major parties for the very reasons that you've laid out. I want to go back to something that you said, though. You called it predatory capitalism. Is there another way for capitalism to be, or are we stuck with predatory capitalism? Well, if we look at history, we can look at a point in which capitalists became predatory and they were aided and abetted by legislation. In other words, capitalism by nature is going to extract surplus value. But what we've seen is an extreme extraction of that surplus value. That's predatory capitalism. It's like, I will take every penny you have and then some. I will do more to you than you could do to yourself. We have gotten a a capitalism that has devolved into the exploitive. And we see it, first of all, in terms of a minimum wage, a federal minimum wage that has not increased in 11 years. You know, so 725 is the minimum wage. Now, 
Several states have it higher, several cities have it higher, but the fact of the matter is that's the federal minimum. And so when you decide to go back to states' rights, which is what we're doing with voting rights, you're also doing it with economic rights. And so we can expect to see this kind of extraction of surplus value again and again and again. Well, I want to turn to, you know, you recently wrote in one of your columns, and I want us to put that up on a, uh, up on the screen so the viewers can see it too. But you wrote about our broken democracy. And in particular, you wrote, it's a partisan thing, with most Democrats saying insurrection and most Republicans claiming free speech. When your free speech shatters windows, breaks down doors, and chases capital employees in a place we all once considered sacred, that's not free speech. It's tomfoolery. For the past several months, you've had pundits wringing their hands and whining that the, the that democracy might be destroyed. For some Americans, it was always broken. Can we like just just talk about that a little more? That, that part about for some Americans, it has always been broken. Well, you know, we have invaded other people's countries behind one person, one vote, but we don't have one person, one vote here. How does bloody Rhode Island, little bitty state, you could pick about 10 of them and put them in California. How do they have the same voting rights in the Senate as the state of California does? I mean, that is not one person, one vote. But if you go back and look at the history of our, this country, the Senate was initially only for property holders. And it was put there to uh, repress the instincts, according to James Madison, of the masses. So in other words, the Congress supposed to be the masses, the Senate was supposed to be the protector. So that was never a democracy. We really never had a democracy. And until 1965 with the Voting Rights Act, specifically excluding black people, we never had a democracy. So we run around kumbaya and ourselves talking about democracy. Bull feathers, I'm clean, bit of clean. Bull feathers, we never really had a democracy. And we, do not want to go into the weeds and talk about the many ways that the voices of the people have been suppressed. And then you you go on though, and this is fire for me. You said, let's be clear. So our democracy has always been broken. It's been flawed from its foundation. Can it be repaired? Possibly, but not in this climate, not unless Democrats decide to grow backbone and learn how to fight, not likely. So we pretty much, in the beginning, at the top of this conversation, you were critiquing the Democratic Party. Is there a chance, Doc, at all uh, in this environment? You know, you've got a Maxine Waters, you've got a Bernie Sanders, you've got a few people who want to fight. Then you've got these wuss buddies who just, Want to kumbaya, go along to get along. That's the problem. If you understand, like Maxine said, the, the Congresswoman Waters, I could call her Maxine, she's my friend. But what she has said is grow some, do some, be some. But these folks, they want to be collegial. Well, your collegiality is stifling me. Your collegiality is a noose around my neck. Your collegiality is the brother, the person who walked on by the lynching and said, oh, maybe they did something wrong. And that's what we're doing. We're seeing our democracy lynched. Our democracy lynched and people look at it and say, oh, that's too bad. No, it ain't too bad. It's bluffed up. <laughs> Doc, you're giving me all kinds of phrases to work with that I can get away with <laughs> on <laughs> CYC. I'm trying, I'm focusing. So, <clears throat> For some people who have really lost hope, and for good reason, I mean, we have one party that just absolutely does not give a care, feel that with another word. And then we have another that is squandering the power it was given by the American people. Uh, you said elect a Democrat as president, check. You said help the Democrats hold the House, check. 
You also said, hey, help us win the Senate. Check and check. But yet, that power is being squandered in this moment. But is there another moment that can be created if people would, in your words, grow a backbone? I think that we got to take it to the streets. I think that we have to do economic uh, boycotts. Um, uh, you know, one of the things, uh, my senator sister, is that these people, these corporations who say they have our back, they're still supporting the devil. They still got their money behind the devil. So they have our backs, ha ha. If, you, if your back, my, if my back means that you're supporting the Proud Boys or people who support the Proud Boys, if it means that you're supporting people who are our enemies, and I mean enemies, I'm not trying to be cute about it. Enemies are people who are against human rights, civil rights, voting rights. So if you're giving them money, you ain't right. You just ain't right. Then you cannot make chicken salad out of chicken salad. You know, that my grandma used to always say that. And that's not spin. You know, she was like, you can make chicken salad out of chicken. And you cannot, it ain't gonna taste right. So if you want chicken salad, let's do chicken salad. And that means let's take this thing out. And we have to, and it's, you know, I'm old and I love being old. I really do, because I'm so blessed. I didn't talk so much in my lifetime. It's a one, ain't nobody shot by ass. But praise the Lord, they didn't. Uh, but I am 68 um, and I'm happy to be 68. I need the youngins out there. I need them doing stuff like laying on train tracks. I need them stopping stuff. Let us not allow these people to take our rights away. And that's what they're doing. No, we can't allow it. And as we started at the top of our conversation, just really lifting up Black Voters Matter, Black Women's yes. Roundtable, People for the American know. Way, led by Ben Jealous. I mean, we have some extraordinary folks. Reverend uh, Reverend William Barber. I mean, there's so I many. There's a cross section. I mean, the, the generations are out there. Sunrise, those babies out there doing their thing. You got people on hunger strikes, like our dear brother uh, uh, Madison. Yeah. yeah, Joe is out there hunger strike. You got some of the young, young, younger uh, generation. They're on a hunger strike too, trying to compel these folks in elected office. But it's more have than the that. People- we got to lay down in front of their houses. Well, you know, what you know, when I look at a Dr. King, when I look at our history, I look at people who they weren't scurred. You know, they weren't scurred. They did not care. They stood in front of racists who had guns. And they weren't playing with them. They're like, okay, shoot me. You know? We need more of that. God, we need more of that. Um well, some folks last day on this earth was standing up for voting rights, standing up for civil rights. Literally, people have forgotten about that. And they think it was such a long time ago. Our country is very young when you compare us to other nations. Very, very young. And the 1960s is just like yesterday when you think about it from a historic perspective. Doc, you are an economist, an educator, an activist leader, and an unapologetic truth teller. Our world is so much better, so much brighter because you are in it. Dr. Julianne Malvo, thank you so much for joining us on the conversation. Well, thank you for people back and talk about ethnic studies and about why it's so important and about why it's so important. So please bring me back. We would love to have you back on the conversation, Doc. You spiced it up. You spiced it up for us today. For everybody, thank you so much for joining us. Please, whatever you do, keep the faith, but most importantly, keep the fight. And keep hope alive. Yeah, that too.